Bring out the talent. Bring out the talent. Bring out the talent. Welcome to Bring Out the Talent, a podcast featuring learning and development experts discussing innovative approaches and industry insights. Tune in to hear our talent help develop yours. Now here are your hosts, GTA's CEO and President Maria Melfa and Talent Manager Jocelyn Allen. Well, our dance moves have certainly got better since this morning. This morning, I don't even think we did any dance moves this this morning. We did a light bop this morning. It was a little weird. But are you sure? Because based on David's reaction to the dancing, I feel like he doesn't think it was our best. And I just, <laughs> like, what's up? You got something to say? Or... As long as you're expressing yourself in whatever that was, then I celebrate it. Yeah, I celebrate that's it. what I thought. That's what I thought. Thank you so much. And, and just think, David's the one who picked out our intro music. So, yeah. and that's so a if you don't he's like it, every day since. Exactly. Then <laughs> you are to blame. And yes. I have footage of you dancing, and I will use it if I need to. Oh, boy. No. Oh, see? <laughs> already David. scarred me with my blooper reel. Yeah. <laughs> When we're just giving them more stuff to add. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. boy. Hey, well, we're very excited for our topic and more excited for our guest, who is a long-term partner who we'll introduce in one moment. But let's get started. Where constant change is the only constant, the mastery of change management has become a cornerstone of organizational success and resilience. A recent McKinsey report highlights that 73% of organizations fail to achieve substantial returns on their change management investments, highlighting the complexity and necessity of leading effectively through transitions. In this episode, we are welcome again by our longtime TTA partner, Joe Jordan. Joe is an accomplished speaker, trainer, author, business advisor, master Tupperware distributor. <laughs> Joe has spent over 30 years helping companies around the world accelerate business transformation and enhance individual performance. And guess which one was not true in there? The Just leadership. One. <laughs> no it was the tupperware oh, if this was the tta 10 i'd be failing <laughs> okay joe has worked with many of the fortune 100 companies and has worked with different companies from all industries such as at&t dell ikea kpmg mckinzen and microsoft just to name a few joe will share his expert insights on leadership development critical thinking, change management, communication, equipping us with knowledge to navigate our organizations through the challenging yet rewarding process of change. Welcome, Joe. Thank you, Maria and Jocelyn and David. It's a privilege to be with you today. It's been, been looking forward to this for a long time. And we have too. It's about time you join us. <laughs> you are afraid, but we know we're glad to have you. No, thanks. I finally got on your dance card. I'm glad for that. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So, Joe, with over 30 years of experience that you have helping companies with their business transformations, what would you say are some of the key components of change man of a change management strategy that you found essential for the success of creating these business transformations? Yeah. I've had the wonderful privilege of being part of some change management experiences that were immensely successful and the kind of things you look back on with great gratitude that you got to be part of it. And I've been part of a few that didn't go quite as planned, Jocelyn. And I, I think in this sounds sort of almost cliche-ish, yet it is true. Number one thing that I think is critical in a change management process is that it has to be led from the top. And I don't mean kind of sort of from the top. I mean from the top. Meaning if we really want to lead change in an organization, the CEO or senior most person champions it. They are the person who makes sure, that doesn't necessarily tie to it directly, but they're making sure things are getting implemented. If there are questions, they're making sure they're getting handled. And there's no question in anyone's mind that this is something they are driving. I had the wonderful privilege last, just last week, I think it was, I was with a large apparel organization and had a hundred of their leaders, I think thereabouts, 
in a training program for about four hours. As is typical of the case, the CEO got up, she introduced, or the brand manager or brand president, I should say, we can correct that. Brand president got up and she introduced the program as often they do the case. And then instead of leaving, she sat down at a table. She participated in the discussion. She took notes. She commented during the workshop. And there was absolutely no question in anyone's mind that what they were doing there that day she cared about. That's change management that works, where she's not coming in, okay, folks, I think this is really important, but I have more important things to do, that they're leading it from the top. Number two is, and Harvard mentions this and I had a great article called Transformations That Work in their last issue. And they were talking about some of the same things you used in the introduction, Maria. And they found there that it's critical that you prioritize the energy that's required for it that you make sure you've got the energy to do it and that that energy gets, doesn't get diluted. I worked last year with an organization, joined them in January to do a strategic planning session to help them identify what are the four things we have to do to make it this year. So we identified it, got those nailed down, everything was on track. Then the CEO and his leadership team met seven months later and they asked me to join them. And it's sort of, how do you tell somebody their baby's ugly? We're sitting in the room and <laughs> And the CEO would we work through all of this kind of how are we doing on these four things? And then they said, okay, let's take a look at the PMO. The guy who managed the PMO gets up and they still had 30 projects in flight in their project management office. And I'm going, you can't have four things you got to fix and 30 things you're still messing around. You've got to prioritize the energy. So that's the third one. And then I think probably the most or second one, rather the most important thing that, that it gets forgotten in this process is that leaders must maintain the expectation and the pressure on the organization until the change is realized. And that sounds really cruel and harsh and hard and all that. It's not. It's just, you know that as I know it. If you want to change a behavior, you need to keep the pressure on until it becomes eternal, internalized. And organizations often don't do that. And people revert back to what makes them feel stable, what makes them feel at a point of sort of emotional homeostasis, and they don't implement the new change. So those are kind of the three things. is the leadership piece, the energy piece, and then keeping the pressure on until it gets done. Those are all excellent points. How many change management initiatives do you feel are not successful because they didn't keep up with the energy or the third part that you talk about? They do a really good job talking to mm -hmm. all the people involved, explaining the why, getting people involved. But then after things start moving, mm -hmm. they think, okay, great, we, we got this. And then yeah. we are on to something new and we forget about it. Again, my world's not as big as the whole world, Maria. And from my experience, everyone that hasn't worked, that's been a component of it every time yeah. at, at whatever level. I remember one case where the person that needed to have the pressure kept on them was one of the senior executives, but they didn't. And consequently, they reverted the change and everything went back to the way life was. And so every, I think from my experience, if I'm standing here today and thinking about it, every time it didn't work, that was a component. Yes, I could see that. And I know that I've been guilty at that because you assume because there's been so much conversation, you've had so many meetings, you've mm -hmm. been very visible about things and the, the change and what we want this change to yeah. do for us. And then you, again, go on to something else and then you realize, okay, well, maybe we didn't have full adoption there. Yeah. That's where I think the prioritizing the energy component is critical to recognize, okay, we can't change everything at once and we can't probably keep doing all the things we were doing if we really want to make this dramatic organizational change. And it, it, you know, you may even get it at certain levels, um, but I've seen it at senior most levels in the organization where, yeah, 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 we're, we're making the change and then they don't. And it took the CEO or the COO in some cases stepping in and saying, if I can make a priority for this, you will make it a priority and we will make this change. And <laughs> I remember one of the senior executives in the company coming and speaking in the class I was leading and one day he got up and he opens his mouth and I'm going, there's nothing coming out of this man's mouth that aligns with where we're going. And I was a little bit aghast. And then the next time he came and he spoke, he had the exact opposite message. 
I was going, okay, dad talked to him. And, and, <laughs> and that's, I think that was a great example though, of yes. the leader going, no, you're not allowed to do this. This is where we're going, either get on board or go somewhere else and play because this is where we're going. And I, I so admire that leader for doing that because the person he reined in was not the easiest guy to play the terrain. <laughs> yes. No, I mean, just in the last five minutes, I can see a, a lot of change that we have had that did not go as successful because of that, because not following it to the end, keeping the energy. Yeah, no, it's very interesting. And another thing that I always find fascinating is what constitutes a, a, a change because mm -hmm. sometimes you hire it, it could be just the simple thing as hiring a new employee mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that in itself could be a change mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i know in the past we, we've hired people and it's like great we onboard this person we have them meet with all the different departments they go through the training and you don't realize how much impact or change that has had on other employees. Yeah. So in that case, I never handled it as like a change management initiative, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. yet to all the other employees, it seemed so much more greater than mm -hmm. I imagined. And I know that's just a small example, but I guess, I guess what I'm trying to say is sometimes you don't even know mm -hmm. what mm -hmm constitutes a change for other people because to you it seems very small yeah well it's and, and as you're talking i my analogy i use with mergers and acquisitions i said an m a is sort of mom and dad decide we're going to get married and that's real cool for them now the kids got to sort it out and i think what you're talking about there if, if you adopted a child into your family and i'm not saying work as a family don't don't take the analogy too far mm -hmm. but if you adopted a kid into your family you wouldn't say, okay, kids, welcome, Johnny. Let's all get used to it. There'd be some real exerted effort on how we're going to integrate this dude into this system that we have. And that's exactly what happens every time you make a hire. You're integrating another entity into an established system. And that rocks it at a lot of different levels. Very good analogy. He's full of them. I know. It's good stuff. And like, and I <laughs> like the, the, it's so timely, like you said, Maria, because like I think that there's a lot of companies going through change right now, period. Because if we think about the the our economy right now and decisions that people are making based on that, how much that has changed from three months ago that those decisions that were made were now we look at those things and say, okay, now what in order to kind of like bring that back, right? We're seeing so many companies do it because they've gone from we have to let this people go. Do we need contractors? Do we backfill somebody permanent? Do we do this? Do we upstand a new leadership program at this time because we lost this person because of A? Like, you're right. That one simple thing that is just, oh, we have one person who got promoted. So now we need to fill their position. That's a change. And that could be a very dramatic one at that. But you don't realize it until you realize that, oh, putting this person who was an individual contributor into a leadership role and now replacing this with a completely different individual contributor and we move them up because they were so successful. So in order to make this successful and all work, this person has to be as good as they were. Like, how is that? That's not simple at all. Yeah. Nothing simple about that. And it's right. You have to understand that that's what it means because again, if every little thing is considered a change and has such an impact, mm -hmm. do you need to have change management for every single decision you make? Mm -hmm. We wouldn't have time. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. It's, and again, it comes down to the extent that you invest in. It's just the recognition of, again, mm -hmm. I, I talk about that in, in change management program is that we, by nature, our body seeks a level of equilibrium and homeostasis. So if the room gets hot, you're going to start perspiring. If the room gets cold, you're going to start shivering. Your body is just designed to create that equilibrium for you. Our emotional systems are designed to do the same. And so you institute a change in my world, I'm naturally going to try to find ways to stabilize that consciously or unconsciously. And the fastest, easiest way I can stabilize is resist your change. <laughs> I think just don't let it happen. I, I loved when I was in one organization, I shouldn't say loved, I hated it, but I smile into it that I remember calling someone's voicemail a year after we were acquired by another company. 
and their voicemail said, hi, this is so-and-so still at, and they said the name of the former company, which to me is that wonderful phrase of just because everything's different doesn't mean anything changed. <laughs> you just continue to stay where they are. That's how they created stability for themselves. It is funny though, because those little things could be, is it that they were like, oh, just don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. Or is it that they're not thinking about it, right? Both of which are things that you deal with when you're learning about change management and addressing that issue at hand. Like what are the things that you're not thinking about? And what are the things that people aren't doing because they seem so small and therefore not impactful. But if you're an organization of 5,000 people and all but 75 people kept their signature the same, yes, right. We have, we have a problem here or whatever it is, the voicemail that you, that you were, that you were talking about. Yeah. It can be a little thing can, can become a big thing. We mm -hmm. see it happen all the time. Mm -hmm. Yes, we certainly have done a lot of large change management initiatives after M&A for like a technology implementation. And those are very obvious. I guess what we're talking about right now mm -hmm. is these little changes that you don't realize have so much of an impact. I guess we're talking about all of it, but it's to me, it's always interesting because I've again noticed in these 30 mm -hmm. years that sometimes I haven't made it a priority to mm -hmm figure out a clear plan on these small initiatives. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's, as we know, life is, I wrote something recently on LinkedIn that someone taught me early in my career, duties never conflict. And that sounded so good and it sounded so cool. And I quoted that and I, da, 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 da. and then I realized as I grew up, I have duties that furiously conflict in my life. <laughs> oh my God. All the time. Yeah. I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a friend. I'm a business owner. Da, 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 da. And those things are colliding like atoms every day in my life. And I think that's where the change thing comes in. I'm going, okay, these are going to keep colliding. Which one am I going to let collide over quietly in the corner so I can make these other two hit and have atomic fusion or whatever and out of it create the, the dynamic thing we're trying to accomplish. Right. So there's a lot of crucial components when we talk about change management is because we talk about these big things, the things that are maybe a bit more clear as you talk about, okay, I need change management. I'm recognizing that there's a lot of things happening right now and we, I need some help controlling it. Yeah. But what about there's, once you figure that out or once you recognize that this is something that you want to pursue, there's so many other layers to it and you need to ensure that you are getting what you need in all those crucial phases in order to move forward. So like one of those things is always for us when we are looking at change management, it's it's buy-in, right? Mm -hmm. It's stakeholder buy-in. It's meeting with them and addressing the change with them and getting their perspective. But then it's also everybody else at the organization. What do the employees think? What what are they what do they know about the change? So like what are some some techniques that you have found have been really successful in getting that information, getting that buy-in and making sure that the crucial points from stakeholders through to frontline, mm -hmm. that everybody's bought in and understanding what's about to happen. I, I think there's three principles that I used to guide that. Let me hit those and then I'll talk specifically, if I could, Jocelyn. Three principles that kind of guide me continuously around this change thing is number one, remembering people embrace change at whatever level when their discomfort with the current situation exceeds their fear of change. So I have to make the current environment uncomfortable enough so that you want to embrace the change. Our doctors do that. Our coaches do that. So I have to make it uncomfortable enough so you want to embrace change. And number two is we need to, as we're engaging people, never underestimate a person's ability to resist and avoid a greatly needed change. So we know that in our personal lives, we have this wonderful way of avoiding something we know we don't want to do. And the third thing that I've discovered is people generally don't stop a behavior until you help them release the need for the behavior. Because none of us do anything unless we think it gets us to a better spot than we were in before we did it. And so if people are resisting change or people are doing things counter to where we're trying to go at whatever level, board level on down an organization, I think fundamental to that is help them recognize this behavior no longer gets me where I thought it was getting me. So alleviate their need for the behavior. At a senior level, board level, again, I think we have to make the case for the impact on the business drivers. And if we can't, then I think the board and senior leaders have every reason in the world to push back. If you can't tell me how it's going to help us generate cash, how it's going to increase profitability, how it's a better use of our assets, 
it's going to help us grow the business or take be a better use of our people assets, then if I can be very crass at a board level, don't bother me with it because that's what we're here to do. And I think organizations need to recognize back to that prioritization. There are five things that determine our success. And I just rattled them off. If it's not going to affect those, we're going to have a very difficult time engaging the board and senior leaders because if they're doing their jobs, that's what they care about. As we look at people across the organization, I think that's where we need it to move it to a very personal level where we help folks recognize how it's going to help them achieve their personal professional goals, help them recognize how the change will genuinely create greater opportunities for them. Um, and if we can make that connection, I think candidly, okay, if we, if we can't make that connection, if it's not going to, then maybe they won't fit the new world. There have been more than one time in my life where I've had to sit down and say, okay, have I outlived my usefulness to this organization? Now, that's not a poor me thing. That's not a, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? It's just simply recognizing I fit this organization at the point in time. Do I fit it where it is now? Do I fit it where it's going to be in the next, you know, one year, two year, five years? And I think that's the reality for people. I was doing a program with a sort of a strategic planning session with an organization recently. And there were people in the room that candidly, I'm not sure will fit who the organization is becoming. So we can help them see where there's opportunities. And if they don't want to embrace the new identity of what their role is going to be in the new world, I then think our best thing and nicest thing and most gracious thing we can do is help them find a new opportunity somewhere where they can bring them. So I think at the senior level, it's the business drivers. At a lower level, it's more personal connection. And then at the same time in that personal level, Jocelyn, I think it's helping folks understand they have a responsibility to those five business drivers. So if they don't care about them, candidly, then I'm not sure they're a good fit for the organization either, because this isn't a hobby. We are here to generate cash, to be profitable, to grow the business, to manage our assets and take care of our people. That's the game that we're in. So connecting at the personal level, yes, and not though at the personal level where we're so concerned about that that they fail to realize that you have to really contribute to what we're trying to do, or this isn't going to be a good match for us long-term. That can sound really crass and unkind, and I hope it doesn't sound like I'm lacking compassion. It's just mm -hmm. the reality. Not at all. I know exactly what you're talking about, I agree. unfortunately, because we, we've had good employees that we've had to part ways with because they were not on board. And yeah. for, for whatever reason, I think more so because it was taking more time yeah. for them to understand and to learn new things and they just didn't want to do it. So I, I, I certainly understand what you're, what you're saying, but the problem is if you don't decide to part ways, yeah. obviously on a good note, then it will affect the rest of the company mm -hmm. yeah. and bring morale down and other right. people not getting on board. So it's a hard but necessary decision. Mm -hmm. I think there are five questions, Maria, that we've got to be able to answer. So if I'm going to lead change at any point along the way, and you say, Joe, why is this going on? I need to be able to say, Maria, we're making this change because, and I tell you, when it's complete, the change is going to result in, and I talk about those business drivers, the opportunity for you, whatever. And I say the change is necessary because, and I give you that clear picture, and I'm able to say, now what this means for you is this, and if we don't do it, this is what's going to happen. And I think those five questions are really fundamental. And if I'm a leader in an organization, I ought to kind of have those five and the answers to them going through my mind. And they're going to change. As the change process evolves, they will change a little bit. That's okay. They're going to evolve as well. I just think it, it's, we're story people and we live on stories. So I need to have the story of change running off my lips at any turn. So if you catch me in the hallway at any time, you say, Joe, what's going on? Bang, 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 bang. I can walk through the five dimensions of that and give you the answer. And I, I, I agree with Maria where she said that it wasn't all that harsh. I think that maybe <laughs> when you just look at it kind of on paper, like those words, it's like, oh, wow, that was, that was a lot, Joe, right? But at the end of the day, and I, maybe I'll even make it more dramatic for you, right? It's like the good, the, do we think about the good of the masses or the good of the one? You know what I mean? Like, what's the reason why we're hesitating if that's what it is at that point in time where we've had 
we've talked about those five points Mm -hmm. and this person still isn't on board for either the reasons that Maria mentioned, right? Like that change takes time. And so are they investing the time uh, or do they care? Do they not understand? Like, what is the reason? Mm -hmm. Right. But are we, are we essentially like feeling bad and then saying like, this is, it's really harsh for somebody who is a really good person who could do well to like, say, this isn't the right fit for you anymore because you're not on board with me, but it's really like you're catering, you're holding back that individual for maybe finding something better for themselves if this isn't their vision, but two, you're also letting your organization succumb to the one individual. And that's, a recipe for failure you can't like there's it doesn't make sense to do it any other way and i think people as individuals do realize that too because i on the on the other side of that type of a decision Mm -hmm. people can digest it and understand that it is for the betterment of everybody that's not always a lower performing person to your point Mm -hmm. when i was in an organization a number of years ago earlier in my career where we were doing a massive organizational cultural change and all the right kinds of things where we're going, yes, we want to grow, we want to perform, and we want you to have a life. And we don't want you living here day in and day out and night and morning and everything else. One of our top performing managers in the company, so top seller, top manager, one of our most prominent offices, refused to get on board with this, would not make the change. And she was transitioned out of the organization. So we're not talking about taking somebody deep in the bowels of the company who doesn't get on board. We're taking, and I admired this CEO immensely for she said, no, you may be one of the best performing people in the company, but it's not who we are anymore. And if you can't make this change, it ain't going to work for us. And she transitioned her out of the company. Sometimes it's just, it is, it's just a necessary thing to happen. And you're right. All of the credit goes to to the leaders who are being actual leaders. Yeah. And showing the rest of their organization that this this is real, and I want to make change for good, and that in, that includes what may need to happen because of it. People listening to this are going to say, "Okay, this Jordan guy is like the TTA axe man. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. To change the course no. of his friends, so they don't think that Jordan is uh, out." I'm sure everybody can relate. Today is TTA's Brim Raper, <laughs> Joe Jordan. No, no. <laughs> I'm I'm sure most people that listen to this can relate. Yeah, but uh-huh. good, but then that's the other thing too. Like we like to talk about the hard stuff. Like I used to make this joke a couple episodes ago where I'd be like, I'll be the devil's advocate now because we would talk about all the wonderful things that like change management can do, which is which is what we're getting towards, right? But it doesn't come without people who are listening surely going, okay, yeah, in your dream world, that's how it works, right? But here's what I got going on at my place and how the heck do you expect me to even get started with that? We got to talk about all of it because it is, it's like change is the hardest thing. Every, like we talked about in the beginning, it does, it's not even necessarily have to be the central focus of what you're doing. Like I want my people to learn about change management. So that's the topic of the day. It's based on a change that you're making and you need to manage it around it. So by the time you get to it, it's already happening, right? So whether it happens successfully or it takes a lot of time to get through it it is always it is the one thing that's always around us that people need to learn to either get on board with or move on from based on whatever is best for them and that's like the them includes individuals and a them is a company too yes yes exactly absolutely joe can you give us some practical advice on how leaders can keep the communication clear keep motivation going throughout the process i I think one of the things that i found maria is during a time of change you cannot over communicate It's, it's impossible to say too much the reason is if i don't tell you what's going on your brain's gonna make it up And then when I finally do get around to telling you what's going on, I've got to dislodge your version of reality because your brain's not going to tell you something that's not true. And so now I've got to convince you what I'm telling you is the truth, not what your brain made up about the situation. So the communication, I think, has to be transparent, meaning we tell the truth at all times. At the same time, that doesn't mean we have to tell everyone everything we know about everything all the way along. You can't. There, during a merger and acquisition, we just can't disclose everything. There's, especially in a public company or something like that. At the same time, 
I need to be communicating frequently and there never needs, there should never be a question about the truthfulness of what's coming out of my mouth as a leader. I think one of the ways that leaders can really empower that process, and I've seen that done in two different organizations I've had the privilege of being part of, and that is, this is sound like I'm singing to the, to the choir at this moment, but I think it's true, and that is use training as a voice to the change. I've seen that done very, very successfully in two organizations where one, it was a smaller company. We built what we were trying to do from a change standpoint into our training courses. Another organization where it was a much larger organization and massive change effort going on, where again, the CEO created, we did a four day executive leadership program and people were immersed in understanding, know that you were kind of free to do what you wanted to up to this point. That's no longer scalable. This is who we're becoming. This is how we're going to operate. And so there, there was a huge investment. We're talking millions of dollars probably invested in that thing to make sure that we got that change done there. So I think it's the communicating frequently. And one of the easiest ways is just use the normal processes, the ways we operate, training, et cetera, to communicate and facilitate that change. I think whether it's a blog or podcast or whatever company uses, help folks begin to see it's working. We, we, we've been on this journey because I think sometimes what happens is you get on a change journey. It's like, okay, over the next two years, we're going to evolve to blah, blah, blah. And everybody's waiting for the two-year point when we're there. No, show them. Okay, we're not there that, but we're here. We're not there yet. And we're here so that they see that we've made some progress along the way. It's <laughs> doing a weight loss program or a fitness program, whatever. Yeah. Okay. I can't bench press X, but I can bench press more than I did yesterday. That's the thing we've got to celebrate people. So I think it's, it's really creating those opportunities to celebrate through the communication vehicles you use in the organization can be a critical part of it as well. Here, here to that. I think that communicating even the small changes, right? Like you just said, like my goal might be to bench press 300, but I started at 200 and now I'm at 210, right? Like it, it, that's a huge, that's progress. Like I think that people in any scenario forget to check their progress versus being like, okay, I'm not at the end result yet. I'm not there. And it's the, it's kind of like the least important part to me. Yeah. Right. Cause, cause, cause like, is the, is the end goal going to be the same once you start getting into it and seeing what, what results from the change? Maybe not. Yeah. Is that one of the obstacles that you think that people face a lot is that they get hung up on the end goal versus celebrating the small wins and like, and what other things that could, could, what other things come up that leaders are essentially like facing when it comes to the obstacles that can affect overcoming change? I think you're right on with, with the first one, Jocelyn, is, is helping folks realize we're making progress. We aren't there. We're making progress. No, we're not the market dominator that we want to be. And we're also not the little kid getting pushed around on the playground anymore. And so helping folks recognize that difference. Um, so that that's a critical piece. And I think part of it, too, is creating realistic expectations. As you were talking, I, I just worked out this morning earlier. Um, I've been working out throughout most of my adult life. I cannot bench press what I did when I was 25. I can't do in the gym what I did when I was 30. And you know what? I can still do something. And so I have to, at this stage in my life, create a realistic expectation. When I sit down on the bench press, it still feels good. I still love it. I'm a gym rat at heart. And I love that. You know what, though? I just have to kind of close my eyes and not look at the other kids in the playground. Because at my stage in life, the expectations have to be different. And I think that's for people during change is let's create some realistic expectations. So, Jocelyn, we're, we're not there yet. Okay, so what, what could you get around at this point? What could you find to celebrate in? What could you say, yeah, we got that done? So that you begin to see that there's some progress along the way. So I think it's breaking it in chunks. It's again, though, keeping the focus. We're not going to have 30 projects floating on the side. We're going to say these four things we got to keep focused on. Let's keep coming back to that. And it, it helps folks create what I call planned neglect, where you say, we're deliberately not doing that, Jocelyn. Yes, that's, that is really, really important. And we're deliberately not going to do it right now. You were you're talking about earlier when we were chatting, when we started, when you live in an old house in the Northeast, there's all kinds of things you want to do. And there's things you got to do and things we're going to do. And some of them are going to do five years from now. And that's what I think you need to help folks do along the way. But I think if you implement without leading, you put too much on people at one time, you don't underscore the
the critical things. And I think one of the pieces that really can help us get through those obstacles, and it's another piece I've seen over the years is my experience is if you don't underscore what's not changing, it makes it much harder to embrace what is. In other words, keep bringing people back to Jocelyn, our vision, our mission, our values, the principles to guide us. We haven't messed with any of that. That's all still here. We are still who we are. We just do adapt to survive. And I keep bringing people back to the principles and the vision and the mission and all of those things that aren't changing. Then you can let go of the way we've worked. And my experience is if I don't anchor you in those things, you're going to fight the other because that's all you got. If I don't show the principles and the values and all that, then all you have is the method. And that's where you're going to resist it because that's as good as our vision and values to you, because that's all you see that there is. But if I can bring you to the bigger thing, then you can let folks see it. And I think one of the other obstacles is just simply not practicing what we're asking people to do. People have incredible hypocrisy meters in offices and companies, and especially the newer workforce. Okay. So, and I don't want to sound like some old crusty old guy, because I'm not that. I spend most of my time with people 30 years younger than me. So I'm totally on, on page with them. The fact is they do have incredible hypocrisy barometers and meters, and they can spot it a mile away. And if they're getting caught into a change thing and they're going, yeah, the leader's not doing it. Yeah. My leader's not doing it. Yeah. Somewhere else across the organization, they're really not having to do that. It's not going to happen because they're going to, they just... <laughs> They don't care if you don't like them. They don't care if you're not applauding them because they're self-actualized enough that, okay, you want me to do this, but you're not doing it. I'm not, I'm not going to get on board with that. So there's just a, some of the basic things I think folks can do to, to anchor them. But I've found that one of the biggest things is, again, anchor them in the stuff that's lasting, our values and all of that. Much easier for them to let go of a change in the way we do. things. I love that. That's excellent. It is simple by nature because you know what your mission statement is, but that's mm -hmm. definitely something that I believe a lot of companies overlook right. by bring it, bringing it back yeah. because every change should align to your mission statement and your values. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was working with one company a few years ago where the CEO came in to a hundred and some year old company. It's doing dramatic, dramatic, this is an IT company, dramatic change in the organization, culturally, the way they were working, all that. And one of the ways, yeah, he led it from the top, did all those things, and he funded it. <laughs> it was, it was, there was no question about should we, can we, whatever. Oh, it's out of so-and-so's budget. And for the first two years of this initiative, he funded it out of his budget. And so there was no question that he cared about it, but it also kept people from trying to nickel and dime the thing along the way. Well, should we do this? Well, should we do it? It's part of the change thing. We've got to do it. And it, it was very, very successful. You know, I back to kind of what Maria said, where you're like, it's like you said, it seems so simple, right? It's like, <laughs> yeah, of course, drive your change back to your mission statement. And what you're talking about, Joe, is like leading by example, right? Yeah. Tale as old as time. You do the thing, people do the thing. Like I, there's this one point, it's a very, very simple thing and like not a big deal that affected anything, but it was at a previous um, employer where I was responsible for leading a team as well. Mm -hmm. And I was going over daily tasks, like something as simple of that as that. Here's what we have to do. And here are our due dates. So if you think you can categorize like four of these things and my back was killing me, but we were on the floor, which was essentially customer facing. And I like kneeled over and I just like propped my elbows up so I could kind of like straighten my back and I was still talking. And three seconds after the person I was coaching got down on her elbows too. So she was like leaning with me Interesting. in a customer facing scenario. And it wasn't until I saw her do it mm -hmm. that I realized that I was doing it. And I was just kind of like, I was doing it for like temporary relief, but it was in that moment that I was like, holy cow, like every single thing that I do has to be something that I want them to do. Mm -hmm. Cause she was just mm -hmm. like, oh, we're being casual. Cool. I'll be casual. I love to relax. Yeah. And it was like that moment. Well, it was a teaching moment for me, even again, so simple, didn't change anything, wouldn't have affected anything. Nobody would have cared. But I was like, I don't want you doing that. So, but like, I just did it. So I can't like tell you that I don't want you doing that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
leading by example is yeah. is huge. Is huge yeah. when it comes to anything, but change more specifically. No, if you want people to do something a hundred percent differently than the way that they've been doing it before, and you stay the same, no buy-in. People are yeah. not going to get down with that. Yeah, I think at a fundamental piece with that to Jocelyn and Marie is the, and I learned this when I was doing career transition with work. I would think we'd agree. One of the most unwanted impactful change can happen in your life when somebody says, hi, you're no longer to become part of our organization. And that was not your plan. And I discovered in that time, there's really two models that drove people. If my life is driven by fear during that kind of change, I'm going to expect security. I'm going to assign blame when I don't get it, which is going to lead me to try to control everything going on around me. And I'm going to mismanage relationships and create conflict. It's just, it's going to happen because I'm driven by fear. And I notice that in people. People who are coming to that situation out of fear, they were blaming the company. They were going, I should have been there. That was my family and all that kind of stuff. They were trying to control things they couldn't control and et cetera. The folks who are driven by trust, they embraced the change. They accepted responsibility. I got to go find a new job now. Okay. They accepted that responsibility. They created freedom in their relationships and they maximized connectedness. They weren't hoarding the job leads. They were telling other people about them too, realizing there's an abundance here for us. And I saw such a dramatic difference. And I think that comes out in a change thing. If I create an environment of trust, it makes it a whole lot easier. If however we got there, there is at the core of the organization, a fear model driving people, it makes it much, much more difficult to lead through a change process. Can I tell one more story based on our little storm thing yesterday? I was thinking about this in preparation for our session that we had this big storm, windstorm situation in North Texas yesterday. And we have a lot of tree damage. And I was driving around looking at the trees and I thought, why are some standing and some aren't? And I realized some of the trees that fell were young and immature and they didn't have any roots. There's nothing to rink them down, so they're over. The thing that's interesting though is more damage was on the older mature trees. And I realized they're anchored, they're rooted, and they're no longer flexible. And that struck me. The trees that are really damaged around us today are big and strong, and they've got a lot to them. Yet, unfortunately, in their age, they've lost their flexibility. And they're the ones that fell apart. And they're on people's houses, and they're in the streets, and they're on the roads, and all of that. And I thought, well, so we need to be able to not withstand change, to work through change is you need the roots, the values, the principles, and I need to maintain my flexibility. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to do it. So I had this wonderful illustration around me all over the place in North Texas. This right. one. That's a brilliant it, illustration. Beautiful really analogy. Is. Yeah. I say it all the time. I love real world stuff like that. <laughs> when you can compare it to something as simple as that, where you're like, and then it's just, it makes you think, you're like, wow. That really is what it is. It, it, it absolutely, it's a very cool picture to paint, to paint for sure. So Joe, as we wrap up our session today, yeah. what advice would you give to our audience that is going to go through significant change or currently experiencing mm -hmm. significant change? On, on the humor side, Marie, I'd say, okay, AI isn't going to fix it. Okay, so just to clarify, okay, folks, AI is a wonderful thing, but it ain't going to fix this. So let's just set that one aside. But seriously, number one, lead it from the top. And that's just keep coming back to it because it is so critical. It must be led, not driven, not forced, led by the top. Number two, communicate as much as you can at every turn during the process. Thirdly, engage everyone in it. Research tells us people get behind something if they have a voice in it, even if they don't get a vote give them a voice. So engage people in that process at every level, including their customers. As we're going through a change, connecting with the customers, okay, how's this going for you? Because I think that's ideally why we're doing it. Thirdly, create the environment to support it. We've got that trust-based environment so people don't revert to their fear responses. And then number five, don't stop until it's internalized. And that's the thing that is critical. As much as it's important that I lead it, We've got to keep the energy on it until it becomes internalized. Now, if we could all do that easily, those five little things would make the world so much better. And we know it's not as easy as five little steps, yet those are the five I'd anchor it on in conclusion. Right on. I'm going to put those on my whiteboard. Excellent. Yeah.
Five is definitely a good place to start, but you know what's even better? The TTA 10. It's the TTA 10. 10 final questions for our guest. All right, Joe, thank you so much for probably one of the best segues I might have ever had, but from the interview to the TTA 10. But as we discussed in the beginning of the show, I'm going to ask you 10 questions, rapid fire. They're playful. They're fun. And there's no right or wrong answer. We just want you to answer instinctively because it adds a playful aspect to the to the podcast and lets okay. the guests get to know you a little bit better. All We're going right. to put 90 seconds on the clock. If you answer the questions in 90 seconds or less, David's going to have a special little ditty to uh, celebrate you, okay? And that is all in the name of good fun, okay? Right. So are you ready? I'm ready. I'm bracing for it. All right. He's ready for the change. David, 90 seconds, please. 90 seconds on the TTA 10 clock beginning now. Joe, if you could trade lives with anyone for a single day to experience it, who would it be? Oh my gosh. Jules Verne, because he flew all over the place. And what I is, love hot air balloons. What is six plus two? Eight. <laughs> What's one thing you'd love to be able to eliminate from your morning routine every day? My morning routine? Probably drying my hair because I find it's just, I always have this hair thing going on. <laughs> if you were a plant, where would you get your nourishment from? Hydroponics. Well, okay. You have to give a Ted talk on ice cream. What do you call it? One of my favorite things when it comes from a really good place. Okay. <laughs> Old McDonald had a farm, but what does new McDonald have? AI. <laughs> What's a phrase you wish had a definition in the dictionary? Phrase. Or a word. I or a word. Might be easier. Um, I make up words. Fabulousness. Exactly. That's one of my new words. Fabulousness. Fab Love yes. it. What's your favorite breakfast food? Probably a form of protein. Gum or mints for fresh breath? Mints. Garden gnomes. Are they cute or creepy? Well, I probably should say they're cute because I'm Scandinavian and many of them are supposed to be little elves and gnomes from Scandinavia, but I think most of them are creepy looking actually. Okay. Thank you for your honesty, Joe. David, with that, we've asked 10 questions. What is the final Well, block? adjusting for Jocelyn's nonsensical question about the dictionary. <laughs> He comes in just under the 90-second threshold. Joe is a champion. Congratulations. Yay! And we do have a salute for you. And I know you are not a native of Texas, but you're a resident of Texas. And so the TTN machine has fired up a honky-tonk song to salute you, Joe. Let's take a listen. Oh He's not from Texas, but he calls it home, Joe. <laughs> oh, Joe Jordan, you light up the room with wisdom and laughter. You chase away the gloom from boardrooms to campgrounds. No place too small. Finding Joe's a great deal, just like Monty Hall. <laughs> Merity decisions, better results. You teach making conflict to create deal force within a reach. Critical thinking for business, newer shines and communication. Check out the brain on Joe. Building client relationships the flash arc of your life. Let the future be vast. Painting for now, keeping a strong Joe. And success go together like damn son and mom. From Texas to the world, your legacy will stay in every heart and mind. Every single day, so the next time you're down south, this is important. <laughs> Get some southern barbecue and call Joe Jordan. <laughs> All right, David, I have never had a song written about me, David. I'm totally honored and totally amazed. I, I hope... think your new tagline needs to be so when you're in the South, this is important. Get some barbecue and culture. <laughs> <Jordan. laughs> I, yeah. I may put that on my website. <laughs> might be Fabulous. my favorite thing that's ever come out of these things. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Thank you, Joe. 
For more information on change management and bringing Joe's programs to your organization, visit us at thetrainingassociates.com. We'll see you later.